This is Q on CBC Radio 1 across Canada, Sirius 137 across North America from PRI, Public Radio International in the United States, and on bold television. For eight years now, the virtuosic David Longstreth has anchored the transient collective known as Dirty Projectors, which counts Ezra Koenig and Rastam batman Glige of Vampire Weekend among, amongst its alumni. And through the years, they've earned that experimental descriptor with a string of equally dynamic releases. Take 2005's The Getty Address, an electronic glitch opera about Eagles founder Don Henley, or 2007's Rise Above, where Longstreth attempted to reinvent a record by hardcore punk pioneers Black Flag from memory, not having heard the album for more than a decade. Dirty Projector's experimental sound became a little more accessible last year after locking in its lineup David Longstreth, plus Amber Kaufman, Nat Baldwin, Haley Deckel, Angel Deradurion, and Brian McComer, and finding critical and popular success with their latest release. Bite Orica blends complex African guitar styles, standout vocal structures with R&B and orchestral flourish, and it's won over musical icons from David Byrne to Bjork, both of whom have since collaborated with the D- Dirty Projectors. Now the band is set to re-release Bite Orica, but first, Dirty Projectors are with me here in Studio Q for a chat and a performance from the record. Hello, band. Hi. Well, hey. Or, 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 hello, you two and the band who are... Um, shooting this on little cameras behind. I've got David and Amber at the at the table here. Hello, you two. Hi. What hey. a pleasure it is to have you here, and we're big fans of this record here at Q, and uh, excited to get to uh, bring more listeners to it. Hopefully, uh, musically, David, this this record seems like a bit of a new direction for Dirty Projectors. It's still rife with innovation, but it's also, uh, I dare say, more listener friendly or accessible. Where was your head at when you were mapping out this one? Um, well, without much of a map, really, I just started with uh, the songs themselves um, and just making, a, you know, I thought of it as making an album as a whole in the same way that uh, some of those other records that you were talking about, um, I thought about those at the beginning of the process, but here it was just making really beautiful songs. What does an album as a whole mean to you? You know, as a unified collection, something that makes sense together. There's a lot of talk about us being in an era where we move away from, we've moved away from an album as a whole. We've moved into a period of eclectic songs that you pluck off on iTunes. Uh, is, is this a reaction to that, would you say? No, not at all. I mean, it seems like you can just choose to do whatever you want. You can, you're choosing to make a song. So there's nothing more anachronistic about an album than about a song. Do you um, so so this wasn't a, a conscious attempt to do something more accessible? That that's just sort of been projected on it by those of us who listen to it and go, this is more widely uh, accessible. Just a bunch of dirty projection. <laughs> Amber, were you thinking about the audience? Do you think about the audience when you make a recording like this? Mm, no, I don't think not while you're recording. You just think about the music. At least I think I did. Um, I think, yeah, you you think about that later. <laughs> in other words, did you guys have conversations in the studio at all about what people's conception of Dirty Projectors is and whether this will alter it or or confirm it or perpetuate it? No, no, not in the studio. No, it's, it's, uh, it's not the kind of thing you really think about until it's already out, you know. And, and David, same question to you. Yeah, I mean, I think that... Uh, that um you, you know why I'm saying this right because you got you when you when you get this rep of, of being the experimental guy the experimental mm. band yeah I, I wonder if you self-consciously begin to think I, I got to keep up my experimental chops otherwise I'm going to disappoint people somehow not really I mean it's a cliche but you really have to just do it for yourself and uh and hope that that aligns with you know what people want to hear or are interested in listening to or thinking about and uh, I don't know it's also worth noting that when we when I was first writing this album and we were recording it um, you know I feel like the band has grown a lot in the course of this record and so those kind of like questions of artistic intention or something like that are even less um, appropriate you know it was kind of just us like sitting around in a sweaty room you know it was a, it was a particularly un, un- air conditioned studio was it? 
Um, yeah, we actually um, just recorded, and our friend, our friend uh, had gotten this really large, old, like 100-year-old, which is very old on the West Coast, uh, building in Portland, Oregon. And it used to be a big like laundry facility back when a horse-drawn carriage would just go through the streets and pick up everybody's linens, you know. So it was this gigantic old warehouse building, and we just kind of built, um, you know, recording spaces into different rooms. It was really fun. Oh, that sounds like fun. Are there still uh, laundry machines there? Um, only like, you know, an would, auto automatic washer-dryer. <laughs> it would help for <laughs> multitasking, you know. That's true. They Take two and get the stuff out of the dryer, Amber, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Or David. Uh, so well, I want to get to what it's no. like to, 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 to be in the, uh, the, did I touch a nerve about laundry? No, no. No, okay, no, yeah. <laughs> no, the dirty projectors, I thought maybe. Uh, let me uh, get back to what it's like to work as a collective now um, and how that might have reshaped things. But just to stick with the record first, uh, sonically, I mean, to anyone who's, new to your band they'll immediately pick up on the presence of the way you use voices as an instrument on this record it's not just for carrying a melody why is it important for you to have the voice both at the center and at the backdrop of music um i don't know i think the voice is really expressive um there's something like kind of undeniable about a voice uh and you know a bunch of voices singing together even more so um, and it's really fun to sing together and also um, I don't like synthesizers <laughs> so it's cool <laughs> uh, well I guess I like some synthesizers now but uh, but uh, it's cool to realize that you can do just yourself what you would otherwise you know ask or demand your technology to do. Do you write them as vocal parts or do you write them on an instrument and then uh, project them onto uh, voices? Uh, I don't know, a little bit of both. Like I'll be working on something on a guitar or like a keyboard and imagine that it's gonna go towards guitars in a different way or vocals, something like that. And what, what, what don't you like about synthesizers? Um, well, I like it when they're low. I like low synthesizers. <laughs> You mean on the scale or low in volume wise? No, on the scale. Okay. Yeah, yeah. When they're deep, I like a deep synth. You like a deep synth. Yeah. You like your synths deep, but, yeah. but but I mean, a synthesizer does that even mean anything? I mean, it's it's a controller <laughs> for a, a number of different sounds, right? So what do you mean? What are you thinking when you say you don't like just synthesizer? things that synthesize? <laughs> you know. Right. I'm not into synthesis. Um, you know. In that court, in that sort of way. Okay, I don't. I'm not sure I know what that means. I, no, I, I don't think it really means anything at all. <laughs> okay, as long as we're both clear on that, that's helpful. I, but I you, just saw your eyes glaze over. You're like, all right, where are we going? No, I listen. I, I, I'm just the kind of guy who will ask you what that means if I don't know what it is. Uh, the, you use a vocal technique called hocketing. What, what what is that? It's uh, it's not necessarily a vocal technique, and. Um, it's uh it's basically it's kind of like the opposite of uh synthesizing in that it's like you take um just a single line like a melodic line and you break it into different uh compo you know components it's a way of uh of just kind of sharing uh a melody across many people you know rather than have one person just sing all the notes they can just have half and then fine with that and the other person takes the other half hmm. and then together it's a it's a whole thing again i i mean i guess for me like hocketing it like the um the analog in the world would be um just conversation you know one person says something the other person reacts to it and uh and i like about uh i like about that particular technique that it's almost like a distillation or like a like a abstraction of that, you know, it, it turns that feeling of sharing into some sort of uh, audible icon. Okay. Uh, it, this is an interesting um, new form of the dirty projectors over the last couple of years because I mean you're the one constant. This has been sort of your project for many years. Now it's a band. Uh, how how do you adjust? 
to sharing the wealth uh, creatively? Or, or do you? Are you a control freak still? Well, I don't know. I think I always thought of it as a band, uh, even when it was just me, like, in a dorm room. Um, I want there to be something that's, uh, you know, the product of a lot of people's labor, a lot of people's love. Um, and so, I don't know, in that, in that sense, like, um, all of us have been on tour doing this stuff for basically four years. It's somewhat of a misnomer that it's a... A new thing? A, um, what was the word you, uh, itinerant collective or something like that. (laughs) Yeah, because Nat and I have been playing together since 2006, and same with, uh, Amber and Brian and... Angel joined in the January of 2007, and Haley uh, about two years ago, and that is yeah. So I don't know, yeah. Yeah, so you're, you're, just you're, deep, it feels deeply. like a band. Yeah, Amber is is David still the the, the mastermind, or do you, does it feel like more of a democratic collective? <laughs> uh, it depends on what you're talking about, but if you're asking if Dave writes all the music, he does. I guess uh, so. He's he's the band leader mm-hmm. um, in the studio. Do, do you does he tell you guys what what he prefers you to play, or do, do you sort of jam and workshop what the parts are going to be? He has a pretty good idea of uh, what what uh, what he's looking for. It's, uh, speaking of, uh, if we're, w- what you do do is you you've been collaborating with. I mentioned uh, uh, that you recorded a song with David David Byrne last year, which is. Uh, impressive a lot of it he's a, an idol to many of us and then you made an entire record with Bjork uh, Mount yeah. Witt- Wittenberg Orca uh, I, I want to explore this Amber I know the band has a bit of a history with Bjork tell me about the genesis of that record well uh, Brandon Stosi from Stereo Gum um, had an idea for us to collaborate together for this uh, benefit show there's a place called housing works bookstore in new york um where all the proceeds benefit uh people with aids like they they help get houses for people who have aids and um anyway brandon had the idea for us to work together and so he initiated it and then you know dave and bjork kind of worked out how they would go about it um dave wrote the group of songs and then we performed it at the bookstore um, and then about a year later, we recorded it. What's it like working with Bjork? It's awesome. She's very sweet. She's do you, really did, cool. Does she feel as wildly creative in person as you think Bjork would be? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> She's incredible. <laughs> what? Tell me about your experience working with Bjork. What? What, have you, what did you learn from her? Um, it was yeah. I mean, the energy is a is a is. Uh, I guess what was, um, like, I don't know if I was surprised or or what exactly, but just, um, just how, how hugely she's talented, um, as a singer and as a person with, uh, with a vision, you know, it's just very clear as soon as she's in the room and she's just being very nice and like, you know, kind of broing down about how she likes to drink ginger tea too, but it's like, uh, yeah, she's just. How definitive is her vision? Like, is she easy to collaborate with? Does she exchange ideas, or does she sort of say, "This, I, I'm, this is my my thought. This is how I'm going to do this." Right. Yeah. Well, that even that's so interesting. She's like a total Jedi, um, <laughs> because at every point she was just saying yes, you know, and uh, she seemed really to be offering herself um to to what we were doing and uh to the way that I wanted to um make these songs but then at the end of it it feels like we did exactly what she thought of Hmm. or something you know what I mean I felt like we all um I actually feel like we we made her like a vision of hers right somehow that's how she's the jedi she you, you go through the motions but ultimately right she spun it uh, the, uh, somehow yeah i feel that way that's funny because that's what i would want to believe about bjork 
you know, as a fan, like that she she has that sort of creative magical power. But and but it, it also it's an interesting collaboration because it makes sense musically. It it sounds like very much in concert with you, that you're in concert with what Bjork would do. Are you a Bjork fan? Yeah, I love her music. Well, how do you? How does this latest spate of uh, uh, attention and success that you're getting, how does that affect your uh, own musical motivation and, and creative direction? In other words, uh, you know, the, the, the affirmation of David Byrne uh, and working with him, Bjork, you're, you're, um, you're playing with the LA Philharmonic and at the Lincoln Center. Uh, I mean, you're known as a very DIY kind of guy. So uh, does that affect... Do you worry about that affecting uh, the Dirty Projector's imperative somehow? Um, no. I mean, yeah, it's been it's been these these collaborations with uh, with David and with Bjork have been so amazing. Uh, like on a yeah on a personal level and artistic level to connect with these people that uh, whose work you've admired for you know decades and to and to see a little bit of the way they work and uh and also just to you know to to actually find out that there are such they are such cool people you know it's mm. really it's really really um neat um as far as like the um uh you know the validation of those sort of institutions you're talking about the Los yeah. Angeles Philharmonic feeling and stuff. more mainstream somehow because of that you know oh I yeah I mean I guess that means less and I'll, it's just an interesting moment because I think that uh though you know the orchestras in the major cities are looking to um you know make themselves more contemporary or relevant or right. something like that and at the same time there's there's an element of like bands that come from um you know the Michael Azarad world of um, starting a band in your bedroom or whatever um, that I think after all this time you know starting out as this scrappy nephew back in the 80s would seek that sort of validation from these big cultural houses but I don't know how holy a marriage it's really been what's the dream for or what's the teenage schoolgirl dream if you put it if I can put it that way for, for, for dirty projectors I mean ultimately what do you want to do 10 nights at Madison Square Garden is that like uh, w would that be good is that what, what you aspire to yeah I mean I don't know I mean this album <clears throat> again like I think all of us just really um, we've been on tour for like two years so those are it's those are interesting questions but not ones that I've had time to really think about you know I really don't know what to do now I want to I'm <laughs> really stoked that you guys are going to play a song for us live here um, you, you're going to play something uh, what are you going to play for us is it it's it's off off the record I would assume off, off Pete's Orca yeah yeah uh, I think we're going to play No Intention alright head on over there alright 